Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. Last night, Greg laid out the general framework of the Buddha's teachings. There's the Four Noble Truths culminating in the path of practice, the Eightfold Noble Path that we're all engaged in. So tonight I'd like to speak about two of those Noble Truths, the second and the third, the cause of suffering and the end of suffering. Um, It said that the first words after the Buddha's enlightenment that came to his mind, we might call it his own song of awakening, said, O house builder, you have now been seen. You will build no house again. So this is the house of self house builder, this creator of the sense of self, you have now been seen, you will build no house again. Then he goes on describing how it was built. In the last two lines, he says, realized is the unconditioned, achieved is the end of craving. So remember that last line. Realized is the unconditioned, achieved is the end of craving. And then again in the the first discourse that he gave to the five ascetics, that famous discourse called setting the wheel of the Dharma in motion. That wheel of the Dharma that has rolled over 2,600 years over continents and oceans to Woodacre, California. He said, and this bhikkhus is the noble truth of the cessation of dukkha, the fading and cessation, renunciation, relinquishment, and letting go of craving. So these are very clear and unambiguous statements of what frees the mind. Achieved is the end of craving. Because when we hear this, we might feel a little daunted by that, or overwhelmed, or simply unready for such a radical transformation of how we're living. Can we even imagine a mind that's free of craving, free of desire? Now, we might more easily resonate with the famous prayer of St. Augustine when he said, Dear Lord, make me chaste, but not yet. (laughs) I think that's probably more the situation we're in. Let me be free of craving, but not quite yet. Some years ago on self-retreat, I was just reflecting on these teachings, and I began to explore them and understand them in a very different way, in a more immediate way. Because previous to that, I had understood this truth, this third noble truth, the cessation of craving. I had understood it only as some far-off goal. You know, we'll walk the path and however many years or lifetimes it takes, at some point, you know, we'll accomplish the end of craving. Or I might have thought of it as some special meditative experience that I might try to hold on to. But in this particular retreat, in reflecting on the teachings, I began to understand it in a very different and more immediate way. And that is the possibility and the practice of the end of craving in the moment for the moment. 
Can we let go of craving for a moment right now? You know, Kamala mentioned a, a teaching uh, of Tulku Urgyen Rinpoche, who was a great Dzogchen master, and he was the one who said that we should practice the recognition of freedom, the free, the free quality of mind for short moments many times. And that's a very useful framework for understanding how we can practice the end of craving for short moments many times. When we explore the meaning of the Buddha's declaration that this is the end of dukkha, the cessation of craving, when we <clears throat> really look to see what that's like for ourselves in our own experience, we can see for ourselves how craving or wanting or desire obscures the natural ease and the natural clarity and openness of mind. And how in those moments when the mind is free of desire, free of wanting, free of craving, we actually can experience for those moments the taste of peace, the taste of freedom. So I'd like to suggest a little experiment that you can make to really see this for yourself. Because as you well know, none of what we say should be believed. It's all an invitation for you to look and just test it out and see, does this resonate with my own lived experience? So the next time a desire should happen upon you, you tomorrow or the next day, (laughs) next month, See if you can recognize that a desire is present, that there's a wanting in the mind for anything. And take a look at what that quality of mind, of wanting, of desire, of craving, really, what does it feel like when the mind uh, is filled with desire or wanting? And then watch... Just the desire, there's wanting, wanting, wanting. And then at a certain point, the wanting will go away, as it always does. It's impermanent, like everything else. And watch carefully how it feels in the, in the mind when the craving is gone. So we're right there with that whole experience. We're, we're attentive to the feeling of wanting, and then aware of what it's like when the mind is free of wanting. And because we're watching that transition so carefully, it will become, I think, so obvious, the dukkha of wanting and the ease of not wanting. It feels, for me, it's felt like all of a sudden I've been let out of the grip of something. Even when the desire is associated with some pleasurable experience, even with that, the wanting itself is, it's like we're being held in the grip and then all of a sudden released. So we can, we can test this for ourselves, to see for ourselves the truth of this. So we need to explore the nature of this grip. You know what that uh, Zen abbess had called the clenched fist in her mind? We need to explore the nature of craving, the nature of wanting, this powerful force of desire that is keeping the whole of samsara rolling along. This is no little thing. Uh, This force in the mind is a very powerful and deeply conditioned habit of the mind with tremendous consequences. So we need to really bring our mindfulness, bring our interest, our investigation. Okay, what is it? What, what's the nature of this craving? We want to see how it manifests not only here on retreat, but to learn from this experience and to be watching how it manifests 
in the world. And then we need to explore some of the different skillful means for freeing ourselves, even for moments, from the compelling force of this craving. So craving is the usual translation of the Pali word tanha. And tanha is described as thirst or the fever of unsatisfied longing. And I like these expressions of thirst and fever because they give a sense just just think for a moment of when you're really thirsty, you know, or feverish. It's a compelling force. Right? It's not it's not just some mild background experience. And that's the force, that's the power of desire. It's not a trivial or superficial habit. Sometimes in English we use the word, the term desire and craving synonymously to mean the same thing. But this can be confusing because the word desire in English has a wide range of meanings. So one meaning is that of greed, of clinging, of craving. You know, so that's one meaning of the word desire. But we also use that word simply to describe a motivation to do something. I have a desire to accomplish some aim. That quality in the mind has a different word in Pali. It's chanda, which is ethically neutral. I mean, sometimes these motivations to act are based on skillful things, sometimes unskillful. So when we use the word desire, it's important to know which meaning we're talking about because it can mean different things. Tonight, I'm going to be using desire synonymously with craving, right? that, that force in the mind uh, rooted in greed and in grasping. Just keep in mind that desire can also mean other things. So don't get confused by that. So when the Buddha spoke of desire or craving as being the cause of suffering, with his usual and spectacular clarity, he laid out three arenas in which this desire or craving plays out. And so we can look in these areas in our own lives to explore how craving and desire works within our own experience. The first and most obvious field of desire, and the one that we are involved in a good part of the day, is the desire we have for sense pleasures. You know, we desire, we like, we want pleasant sights and sounds and smells and tastes and sensations and pleasant mind objects, the sixth sense. I mean, how many of you come into the hall for a sitting? Oh, let me experience some pain in the sitting. Uh, <laughs> probably that doesn't occur to you. Right? But we might well come into the hall, think, oh, yeah, it would be nice to have some pleasant experience. In our lives, there is a wide range of intensity and frequency of desire, of craving. You know, for some people, there are amazingly compelling desires that can consume a life, you know, where there are addictive cravings for drugs, for alcohol, for food, for sex, for power, for success, for wealth. You know, people can have cravings, powerful cravings, for all these things that drive their lives. And in so many ways, our society, our culture, just fosters and values 
you know, this kind of craving comes across a lot in different kinds of advertising. You know, so there was one ad and the, the, the tagline of the ad was, nothing stands in the way of my pleasure. You know, and so, okay, so that's the message we're getting. You know, our pleasure is rules all. Or, you know, there's a lot of internet spam. The headline is, increase your desire. As if somehow that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, and this is what we should be aiming for. And then I was in New York once and walking down the street and I saw a sign in a store window and it said, don't let desire pass you by. <laughs> so we're getting this message all the time, you know, that desire is a good thing and that we should spend our lives strengthening it and feeding it and gratifying it. So it's no wonder that this is a powerful habit in our minds. So we also experience desire, and maybe you know, most of us hopefully don't have these powerful, addictive desires, although we might. But we can also have just an ongoing uh, flow of uh, more ordinary desires, you know, passing thoughts of wanting, wanting this or wanting that. When we're paying attention to that, we see that all of this wanting in the mind takes us out of the natural ease and peace of mind. The Dalai Lama tells a wonderful story of himself, and it's with his usual humility. Uh, so he was just describing once, giving you know, a public talk in uh, L.A., and he was being driven to the, to the conference center. And they were going down some street, and the street had a lot of stores, shops, with all the latest techno gizmos. And he commented later that as he was driving by, he found himself wanting things he didn't even know what they were. <laughs> You know, but they, they just looked. I, I think we probably all had that, you know. There's just something appealing about lots of different things, even if we don't quite know what they are. Another example of this, kind of it's a mild addiction. It's an addiction to wanting itself. And it's something I call catalog consciousness. <laughs> you know the experience when you've made the mistake of opening a catalog, <laughs> and then you turn the pages waiting for something to want. <laughs> oh no, not on this page. Or maybe I'll want something on the next page. <laughs> and it's, it is addictive. I mean. How many of us actually put the catalog down after the first page or two? Now maybe, <laughs> maybe if I keep going, I'll find something to want. So this is strong. This is a strong desire. Sometimes we, ex we can experience the deeply rooted persistence of even very small desires. And this I've seen very often on retreat. So I can be on retreat, just sitting and walking and into my practice, and then the thought might come, oh, a cup of tea, that would be nice. But I notice it. I don't know, just thinking, thinking. Take a few more steps. Oh, a cup of tea. <laughs> just noted, thinking, thinking. Oh, a cup of tea. <laughs> you know, and maybe I could note it five times, 10 times, 20 times. Oh, a cup of tea. Go for the tea. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a small desire with a deep root, right? And it just, it's like that, you know, the blade of grass that'll come up through cement. A very small thing, but just very persistent. I think the problem or the challenge for us is that so many of these desires of wanting, they're so familiar to us, they just seem the ordinary, the part of our ordinary lives. 
we've stopped paying attention to it. You know, they, they've really become invisible to us because we just take them as the norm. And it's only when we start to bring a careful mindfulness and attentiveness to our own minds and are watching the process, so then they become illuminated and we begin to see the power of this craving. It doesn't have to do with how big or small the object is. The craving itself, the wanting itself, is a very powerful force. So being on retreat, this is a perfect laboratory for really exploring and investigating and paying attention to the nature of craving, to the nature of wanting, to see how it arises in the course of a day. You know, you might experience it just as the indulging of pleasant thought processes. You know, you're sitting and some kind of thought, maybe it's the next project you want to do, or the whatever, the next vacation you're going to take. And we just get lost in the fantasy of it. And it's a pleasant way to spend an hour. You know, it goes quickly. <laughs> so that's just feeding, that's a, that's a kind of craving, wanting of a sense pleasure, you know, of the mind. It might be enticing sexual fantasies. You know, there are different times in our practice where that can come up very strongly and very seductive. You know, there's, there's a great deal of pleasant feeling associated with that. What's interesting to observe is how often we can get caught up in these different fantasies, pleasant fantasies, even though we know they don't lead any place. They don't go any place at all. And there was one period of my practice when I was having a lot of these experiences and I was trying all kinds of different remedies. And finally I came up with a mental sign that I planted just as the fantasy would begin. The sign said, dead end. <laughs> and it was just a reminder to me at the beginning that this is not going anyplace. You know, I could spend however long, but then it's just coming back and starting again. So maybe I didn't have to go down that path for the hundredth time. We can experience craving just in a kind of expectation you know, that we bring to our practice. We want some new pleasant meditative experience very helpful to keep an eye out for the expecting mind. Expectation is a huge hindrance. It always brings agitation to the mind. It's not helpful in any way. It keeps us locked into cycles of hope and fear. When there's expectation in the mind, there's hope that we'll get something and fear that we won't. And so we just keep getting tossed back and forth. Sometimes people confuse expectation with aspiration. And these are two very different mind states. Because we can have a wise aspiration in our practice. Maybe we have the aspiration to awaken, or to become more compassionate or more loving. So this is a wise aspiration, it sets a direction. That's very different than expectation, which is trying to control how our moment-to-moment -moment experience unfolds, which is impossible. So we can have an aspiration that kind of sets the direction, understanding that the fulfillment of that aspiration is actually from a letting go, not from a grasping at, not from a wanting. So we need to see this because this happens a lot in practice. <clears throat> you know, we confuse that wise aspiration with expectation. When desires and craving and wanting are unnoticed, 
which is a good part of the time, not only are they hindering concentration, and that's why it's called a hindrance, that's what it's hindering, it's hindering the development of concentration and ease, not only do they hinder that, they don't even deliver on their promise of happiness. You know, why do we get seduced by desire and wanting and craving? Because they're holding out the promise, if we go for this, it's going to make us happy. Right? And so that's why we get seduced again and again. The problem is that the pleasant feelings which are often associated with desire and the fulfillment of the desire is that these pleasant feelings, as we've said very often now, they don't last, they're very impermanent. So then we go after another one to become happy, and another one, and another one, and before we know it, our lives are at an end. <coughs> How many sense pleasures have we already enjoyed in our lives? Many, countless. If they were really capable of providing the happiness that we were seeking, you certainly wouldn't be here. <laughs> You'd be on a beach in Hawaii. So this is telling us something. It's telling us that even though we do get caught up in this wanting mind again and again, a very deep part of us knows that it's not the path to fulfillment. So we know that that's why we're here and that's why we're committed to the practice. Now this doesn't mean that we should never enjoy ourselves or that we should somehow close off the pleasant experience. It's not what it means at all. It's just to understand very deeply the transitory, impermanent, ephemeral nature of the enjoyment that these pleasures bring. So we live our lives and we enjoy things, but they do not become the centerpiece of our lives. And I think it's worth asking how much of our lives, how much of our energy, how many of our choices do we want to devote to this endless pursuit. The habit is strong, and so we need to be quite active in the investigation of this process. Because if we're not, then we'll just be playing out the habit patterns of our conditioning. So it takes an active interest in how our lives are unfolding. So desire for sense pleasures is the first kind of craving. The second kind of craving the Buddha talked about goes even deeper. And that's the basic urge or desire to be for continued existence, desire for renewed existence, particularly in pleasant realms. Now in Buddhist cultures, <coughs> that's often uh, described as, you know, desire for rebirth in the heaven realms. Now you may or may not believe in <coughs> rebirth or different planes of existence or the deva realms, even though they're, they're very much in the teachings. But as Manindraji, our first teacher, said, or he used to love talking about them. Yeah, so, and I loved hearing about them. You know, the deva realms and all the heavenly joys and but he would always say, you don't have to believe this. It really is not connected to the path of enlightenment. You don't have to believe it. It's true, but you don't have to believe it. <laughs> so, <laughs> But in terms of the second kind of craving, there is a much more immediate way and more profound way we can experience it, quite independent of rebirth or planes of existence. This craving for becoming. We can see it very clearly every time we get lost in the planning mind, where we're imagining ourselves in some future situation. Notice how often in the course of a day 
we get lost in the mind creation of some future self. A lot. You know, we just, we create these scenarios of ourselves in the future doing something. And then we are just living in that future and we're, we're creating a sense of self in the future. So this is the desire for becoming. So the Buddha gave a very specific and challenging instruction in this regard. And it would be, and it is fascinating to actually put it into practice even for short periods of time. He said, <clears throat> not reviving the past, not hoping to be in the future. Instead, with insight, see each arising state. Not craving after past experience, not setting one's heart on future ones, not bound up with desire and craving. So it's really just to listen to these words, not again, not as Buddhist philosophy, but as an instruction, something to do. What would it be like to practice this even for short times, not reviving the past, not hoping to be in the future? That would, that would be a radically different way of engaging with life, engaging with the world. So we can, we can actually practice that if, if we call it to mind. And this doesn't mean that it excludes all planning, because we can plan, and we need to plan, you know, in our lives, but are we lost in that future scenario, or are we aware that the planning is happening in the moment? Those are two very different experiences. So one of the most freeing and easing insights that can come in practice, and it does not require any fantastic concentration or anything like that, it's, it's immediately accessible. is looking very directly at what our experience is of time. So I'll just give you an example. And for me, this was a huge letting go of a big burden. So we all know that we spend a lot of time lost in the past, lost in the future. And it might be interesting for you to particularly track in the course of a day, just to take note how often the mind is in the past and how often it's in the future. It will be surprising. It's probably a good percentage of the time. So the question then is, what is our experience of the past? How do we create this notion of past? What happens is that we're going along, we have certain kinds of thoughts, memories, recollections, remembrances. We have these thoughts, we put a concept past onto these kinds of thoughts and then toss that concept back behind us as if the past is back there, as if it's a reality back there. And we do the same thing with future. We have certain kinds of thoughts of anticipation or planning or anticipating. We create a concept for these kinds of thoughts, future. Toss it out ahead of us as if the future is a reality out there waiting for us. And not to get into the metaphysics of time, but really to ask the very simple question, how do you ever experience the past except as a thought in the present? How do you ever experience the future except as a thought in the present? Does this seem clear?
because it is so liberating. When I saw this clearly, when I saw that past and future, that I had been carrying around like two mountains on my shoulders, you know, the burden of carrying the past and carrying the future, and then seeing that my only experience of them was as a thought in the present. A thought in the present is very light. It's just... So I'll just give you a very practical uh, example of this on retreat. How time thoughts can so condition our lives. You're in the retreat, you're going through a hard day, it's pain, boredom, restlessness, and the thought comes, oh my God, four more days, three more days. <laughs> you know, and just that thought of the future, all these days of all this horrible experience. And we feel terrible, you know, just get discouraged and heavy and depressed. What just happened? There was a thought four more days. That's all that happened. If we could see that as a thought, the thought comes and goes, it doesn't condition anything. We see it just for what it was. Or you might be having a great day. And you're, oh, only four more days. I wish it was three months. <laughs> What's that about? It's just a thought in the moment. I would highly recommend you pay attention to this because it is so incredibly freeing. It's not that we don't use these thoughts when appropriate, we do, but we don't create that reality of past and future that we're carrying through our lives. You know, it's tremendously freeing and not difficult to do. We just have to be paying attention. And then, we can go even further. And this is one of my favorite things. There's a, law, there's a verse in the Dhammapada which says, let go of the past, let go of the future, let go of the present, and cross over to the further shore. So this is interesting. Okay, the past and future we, we kind of get and we can understand and be really free to let go of that. Letting go of the present. So this is interesting to see in our meditation. And it comes a lot from a lot of the instructions, you know, be in the present, pay attention to the present. And so what can happen is the mind there can be a very subtle fixation on the present. You know, where we're, where we're fixing the attention, where we're it's a little bit like Velcro, to the present moment. And so the Buddha is suggesting, can we let go of that? It's like dropping back from the, from the clinging or craving or fixation to the present. There's a Portuguese poet named Fernando Pessoa. In one of his poems, the title of it is Live You Say in the Present. So these are the first few lines of the poem. It says, Live you say in the present. Live only in the present. But I don't want the present. I want reality. I only want reality without time present. Yeah, and I thought that even the notion of present is a concept, you know? And so even though we use it as a kind of relative skillful means, okay, we're, you know, let go of past, let go of future, get connected to what's arising now, but then on a more subtle level, can we learn to drop back from any holding to the present? So I'm going to come back to this. Just... There's another kind of craving for becoming that we see in our practice. So it's not only kind of becoming in the future. But have you noticed how often the mind 
in attending to what's arising is leaning into the next moment. It's like we may be lifting the foot in order to move forward or with the in-breath in order to feel the out-breath. Or we're with some unpleasant sensation, we're being mindful of it, but in order for it to diminish, in order for it to go away. So this is what I call in order to mind. You know, when we're with something, but there's a leaning into the future, into the next moment. When this is happening, we are forgetting that liberation comes not from some new experience that's going to happen, that we may be leaning into, wanting, expecting, but liberation and the whole practice that we're doing is about letting go, not about wanting, not about craving. And it's so amazing, even when we practiced for 40 years, this is so strongly conditioned. It's, it's like we're practicing for some experience. You know, we're, we're practicing, we're with the breath in order to get concentrated. Or we're with, you know, we're doing whatever we're doing in order for some new experience to happen. The freedom of mind, which the Buddha declared very simply and accurately, the freedom achieved is the end of craving. That what we're actually practicing is letting go. We're not, we're not practicing wanting something new. We need to hear this a million times, you know, because we just bring that habit of craving from the world of sense pleasures and right into the meditation. That habit of craving of wanting is so strong. So the third kind of craving, I'll just touch on it, uh, the Buddha called a craving for non-existence, wanting to get rid of experience. You know, maybe it's a feeling this life is so bad, I just want out. So I had a really uh, strong experience of this on the first retreat I did with Saida Upandita. This was in 1984 at IMS, and it was a really hard retreat. I was just going through a lot, and a lot of expecting and wanting, and my mind was not in a place of open ease. And I remember one time at a time when in the depths of the struggle, and you have to remember this was back in 84, for those of you who can remember. <laughs> so I heard some airplanes come over, and the thought in my mind was, oh, I hope these are Russian planes about to drop bombs so I can stop <laughs> meditating. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't very compassionate for my fellow... <laughs> I just wanted out. I just didn't want... That's the craving for non-existence. Uh, That probably doesn't happen that often, but there was a good example of it. What is interesting to see about all these kinds of craving, they are all rooted and fed and nourished by the view, the sense of self. Craving for sense pleasure is fed by the sense of self that we want to gratify. The craving for becoming is fed by the sense of self that we want to clone in the future. We want to have some future self. The craving for non-existence is fed by the sense of self that we want to get rid of. So all of these cravings, they're, they're kind of held in that, the soil you know, of the, of the view of self. What's so uh, kind of, I don't know whether ironic is the right word, but it's just so interesting 
both to see this, to see how it's the sense of self which is feeding all of this craving, and also to see that this whole notion of self, it's a notion of something that isn't even there. And so there was, there's a writer by the name of Wei Wu, his pen name is Wei Wu Wei, and he's either English or Irish, I don't know. He lived in Hong Kong for quite a while, and he clearly had some, some real awakening. His writings are very, uh, a lot of pithy aphorisms, and they're, they're, they're very insightful. So one of them was, he, he wrote, whoever thinks that a self exists objectively and acts on it, is like a dog barking up a tree that isn't there. <laughs> and don't you just love that image? I, you can just see a dog barking up a tree that isn't there. So all of our activities and acting out in the world and cravings are rooted in a belief, a sense, a mistaken view of self, something that's not there in the first place. Of course, this is perhaps the most challenging aspect of the teachings, you know, because it's very counterintuitive. We all, we all feel like there's a self, you know, and we're relating in that way, and we relate to one another as one self to another self. And, and on the relative level, that's true. So one Tibetan teacher expressed the, uh, the paradox of this really beautifully. Somebody was asking him about this whole teaching you know, of not-self. So he said, it's not that you're not real. We all think we're real, and that's not wrong. But you think you're really real you exaggerate it. <laughs> so this is how we have to hold it, because on the relative conventional level, we are operating from this conventional view of self. And this is fine. There's not any problem with that. In fact, we need that. But we're not really real. <laughs> you know, when we go to a deeper level, we begin to see that this notion of self, which is useful on a conventional level, is a fabrication. Okay, so the question for us is, how can we free ourselves from this powerful force of craving that plays out in all of these different ways? In the Pali discourses, there are many very uh, pointed teachings that can help free our mind from craving right in the moment. And it may be for short moments, but we can get a very immediate taste of what this freedom is. And I want to share with you just a few of these teachings. They're, they're teachings, very, they're very brief teachings, but each one of them in the past few years, uh, just on my own retreats, uh, I've just found extremely interesting. You know, and they're kind of new, new applications of the teachings for me. So I'd just like to share what has been of interest to me and which I found helpful. So one of them has similar to something I mentioned earlier in the retreat, if you remember, you know, in the talk on impermanence and encouraging you to really pay attention to the direct seeing, the direct perception of the flow of changes and how then this teaching in seeing impermanence, the mind doesn't cling. When it doesn't cling, it's not agitated. When it's not agitated, it personally attains Nibbana. You remember that. Uh, and suggesting to really look at the mind when it's perceiving impermanence. Well, there's another sequence which I also found very interesting to explore. 
where the Buddha said, seeing impermanence, one becomes disenchanted. Experiencing disenchantment, one becomes dispassionate. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. So these are very powerfully instructive words. Okay, seeing impermanence, we've talked a lot about that. When we're seeing impermanence, really look, investigate what this meaning of disenchanted What does that mean? Because the Buddha used that word a lot as a precursor to enlightenment. So disenchantment is getting free of the enchantment, free of being enchanted by the flow of experience. And so it's a very freeing, it's a very freeing movement of mind. And why does the mind become disenchanted? because we are seeing the impermanence. We're seeing very directly this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, and that nothing is capable of really providing fulfillment because it's continually changing. And so we become disenchanted. We break the spell of the enchantment of experience. Are you getting a sense of it? It's a very powerful movement of the mind. It's it's like instead of being enchanted, we disenchanted. And then being disenchanted, we become dispassionate. Now what is dispassionate? We have to really explore the meaning of these words in our experience. You know, because we might have all kinds of reactions just to hearing the word dispassionate. But what does it actually mean? And the Pali word is viraga, which means absence of lust. When we're disenchanted, the mind is not craving. It's not lusting after experience. Again, it's that movement back into peace. The disenchantment happens when we're seeing the impermanence. From becoming disenchanted, from freeing ourselves from the enchantment, the mind becomes dispassionate. It's not driven by lust, it's not driven by craving. Through dispassion, the mind is liberated. So it's a very, it's a very direct path to experiencing, again, even for a few moments, what freedom of mind means. So one way of practicing with this is just and experiencing the flow of impermanence is the, that's the foundation for exploring. So at those times when you really are in that flow, and it can be in walking meditation, you know, when you're just experiencing the flow of movement. Or in the sitting, as you know, you're just in the flow of changing experience. When you're in that mode of perceiving impermanence, if you're interested, call to mind and look back at the mind that is experiencing the impermanence and call to mind disenchantment. You you will get a felt, immediate sense of what that means in the mind. And, And just hang out there for a while. Hang out with disenchantment. It's like you spend some time exploring the meaning of that in one's experience. And then after you hang out with disenchantment for a while, then just call to mind dispassion. <coughs> so what does that mean? And, and it's just very interesting. We're, we're, we're looking directly at the mind with these qualities. And at those times, we can have a very immediate experience of the taste of peace, of freedom. So this is something that's available for us to do. We just, we just need the interest to do it. Okay, so this is another teaching. These are just a few of my favorites.
So the first was based on the perception of impermanence. This one is grounded in uh, the insight into selflessness. So the Buddha is addressing his disciples. He says, bhikkhus, whatever is not yours, abandon it. When you have abandoned it, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. And then he gives an image. Suppose people were to carry off the grass, the sticks, the branches, and the foliage in this grove of trees, or to burn them, or to do with them as they wish. Would you think people are carrying us off, or burning us, or doing with us as they wish? No, venerable sir, because that is neither our self, nor what belongs to our self. So that's very obvious. <laughs> you know, if somebody carts off the grasses, you know, or burns them or whatever, it's not going to affect us because it doesn't belong to us. Now here's the punchline. So too, bhikkhus, form, the material elements, is not yours. Feeling, vedna, is not yours. Perception is not yours. Volitional formations are not yours. Consciousness is not yours. Abandon them when you have abandoned them, and abandon here means letting go of identification. When you have abandoned them, that will lead to your welfare and happiness. So this, uh, to me, this is a very striking, powerful, radical way of looking at experience. Here, the Buddha is talking about the five aggregates, you know, which is one template for understanding our experience that everything we call self or take to be self is just these five aggregates of the physical elements and the Vedana, the feeling and perceptions and the mind states and consciousness. And it's very interesting, if, if you have the interest, to just go through it occasionally, go through each of these with this understanding, these physical sensations. You're just in your experience and sitting and walking and moving about you're attending to the physical sensations, reminding yourself, this is not I, this is not mine, this is not myself. It doesn't belong to me. Well, that's a very different relationship to the body. Well, feelings, you know, they're pleasant or some pleasant. Not I, not mine, not myself. It's just, it's just these feelings or perceptions or states of mind or consciousness, the consciousness itself, the knowing, not I, not mine, not myself. So sometimes when I'm sitting, I'll just call this little teaching to mind. You know, I'll, 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 I'll say to myself, whatever is not yours, whatever is not mine, abandon it. And then go through the aggregates. There's a tremendous freedom in that. When we're not identified with any of these components of experience as being I, as being self, the mind is at peace. So this is challenging, this this one. But a lot of you are, have been coming to this retreat for many years. Go for it. (laughs) You know, it's like we we can be practicing and just kind of schmoozing along but why not go for the depth, you know, to really go to see what liberates the mind? Because that's what the Buddha's teachings are about. You know, they're not simply about being in a good mood. They're about seeing what is the cause, you know, the essential cause of dukkha, of suffering. And where is the freedom? And the whole point is that there is freedom. And even if we may not attain full realization, this week, we can taste, we can taste what that freedom is like. And these are just, just some examples, you know, of how we can do it. Let go of the past, let go of the future, let go of the present. And cross over to the further shore. <laughs>